Could we say that socialism is as old-fashioned as disco music here in Europe? I know many of you will think this is just one opinion, but before you launch into writing in the comments section, take a look at this rather depressing map. In this map, you can see the remaining social democratic governments in Europe at this time. If you notice, there are hardly any countries in red, and some of them, like Spain, have red parties which are plummeting in the polls. Which means that it's not just opinion that we have here at Visual Politic. Unfortunately, it's a fact. Social democratic parties have less and less power every day. And some of you will say, let's see, Grant. Football and democracy are like that. Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. But the problem is, is that there are many countries in Europe where socialist parties are not even the second political force. And this is a trend that has been going on since the financial crisis of 2008. I'll give you an example. France. For decades, France was a two-party country. The main political forces were their centre-right UMP and the Socialists. But in recent years, the political battle has been between the ultra-nationalists of Marine Le Pen and the Liberals of Macron. The Socialists have become the third party. Something similar could happen in Germany. And what about Greece? The PASOK Social Democrats are on the verge of disappearing. In other words, the problem is not that the socialists are losing elections. The problem is, is that soon they may disappear altogether. Again, this is not an opinion. This is something very real that is happening and should be of concern to those of us on the left. And what are countries that still have socialist governments? What about them? For example, Denmark. Yes, it is true. Denmark has a social democratic government headed by a woman, Mette Friedrichstein. Now, this lady is nothing like what you'd imagine from a Nordic socialist. Her immigration policy makes Viktor Orban look like a tree-hugging hippie. She has even pledged to have zero refugees. That's right. Put another way, socialism seems to be on the verge of disappearing. And the few remaining socialists are mutating into things that bear very little resemblance to the socialism we have known so far. Put another way, socialists are having an identity crisis where there are three tribes fighting. True socialists, third way, and postmodernists. And it's not at all clear which one of them will win, or if another new tribe will emerge to try and get socialism back on track. Many of you will Ask, how is this possible? After all, there are more billionaires than ever before. People say that the inequalities between rich and poor are getting more and more pronounced. I mean, for God's sake, Jeff Bezos has going to space money. So why have so many people in Europe stopped voting for socialist parties? What is happening? And is there any way to resurrect social democracy in Europe? Today, we're gonna to answer all of these questions. But first, let's look at a little bit of history. The first question we have to ask ourselves is, what is the working class? Think about it. If there's one thing that defines socialists, it's the working class. They are the parties called to represent the common people. Now then, what is a worker and how is he or she defined? According to Karl Marx, workers are those who do not own the means of production. That is to say, we could divide society into two groups, the capitalists who own companies and factories and the workers who provide the labor, receive salary and do not own property. Having made this clarification in just a few less words than Karl Marx, our history begins in 1918. That is the year of the definitive clash between communists and socialists. Both had the same goal, to put an end to capitalism and establish a dictatorship of the proletariat. The difference is, is that the communists did it by the means of a violent revolution in Russia. The social democrats want to achieve it by winning elections in liberal democracies, passing new laws and making a gradual transition. As you can imagine, the pure Marxists said that the Social Democrats were deluded to thinking they could change the system from within. I know, leftist infighting, that's not a thing, right? However, history has shown that the Social Democrats were right. Yes, it is true, the Orthodox Marxists had their revolutions in agricultural countries. Both Russia and China had their communist revolutions. But in industrial and wealthy Europe, that Europe was the stronghold of the Social Democrats. In 1918, Germany was the first country in the world to have a social democratic government. Think about it. If politics is the market, the socialists had a perfect product. It was aimed at the majority group, the workers. Remember, this was 1918. Almost the entire economy was based on industry. A few capitalists dominated the enterprises and the rest were workers. Workers who were potential voters of the German Social Democratic Party. This is how the boom of socialism began. After the Germans came the Nordic countries, Sweden, Norway, Denmark. All of them were countries with huge industrial sectors. All of them were the perfect breeding ground for socialist parties to take over. But wait a moment, because this is only the beginning. In 1929, something happened that triggered the success of social democracy until it became the dominant ideology. Yes, you guessed it. We are talking about the crash of 29, the great collapse of the financial system. At that time, the political parties that defended the free market lost 
all their credibility. For obvious reasons, the majority of voters switched to voting for left-wing parties, parties that defend the interests of the workers. From the United States to the Nordic countries, all democratic governments reinvented themselves. And if you thought that the Second World War brought this whole socialist wave to a halt, you are wrong. From the 1940s to the 1980s, the entire developed world embraced an economic system where the state played a fundamental role in business. This was the era of the birth of the welfare state, Keynesian economics, high taxes, and large public enterprises. The socialists were red hot. Okay, maybe they didn't overthrow capitalism, but they were damn sure going to reform it. However, everything changed again in the 1970s. The social democratic model collapsed. And 10 years later, so did the Soviet Union. Suddenly, the idea of ending capitalism slowly or revolutionarily was no longer attractive. So socialists and communists stopped winning elections. But if you thought this was the end of socialism in Europe, you are wrong. The social democrats did not die. They simply evolved. This is how the so-called Third Way was born. The Third Way was the response by the left to the fall of pure socialism. And now I know what a lot of you are thinking. The Third Way? Wasn't that when the Social Democrats totally sold their soul to capitalism? Yes, that's both what communists and classical socialists would say. But the truth is that the Third Way allowed the socialist parties to sweep the floor once again in various elections. This was the era of Tony Blair in the UK, Gerhard Schroeder in Germany, and even Zapatero in Spain. In fact, more or less the 1990s and 2000s were the golden years of the left in Europe. These days, however, things have changed. Why? Well, we're going to look at that right now. A working class hero is nothing to be. If any of you are affiliated with any left wing party, you will surely have heard it a thousand times. The problem with the socialists is that they have forgotten the working class. The question is, who are the working class today? If we go by Marx's definition, workers are those who earn a wage and do not own the means of production. By this definition, Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, is working class. And no, we've not gone mad. The CEO of any company is a worker who is paid a salary. The salary is set by the board of shareholders who are the ones who own the means. However, no one can imagine a chief executive joining a union, can they? Well, obviously not. The first thing we have to do is to redefine the working class. We could say that blue collar workers are those who have unskilled jobs. That is people who work in mechanical jobs that do not require a university degree. Until the 1980s, this was the majority throughout Europe. But today, the reality is very different. Take a look at this graph. In this graph, you can see how there are fewer and fewer workers in France. We've used the example of France, but we could use almost any other European country. Manufacturing jobs are in danger of extinction, and the new majority working class all over Europe are professionals. That is, people who have gone to university and work in offices. They already account for more than 20% of the workforce here in Europe. Think about it, almost all industry has left Europe for China and other Asian countries, and the new factories are nothing like the factories of the 20th century. It used to take hundreds of assembly line workers to produce a car. Now, that work is done by robots. And the workers who manage those robots are specialized engineers who've gone to university. If you don't believe me, well, we're going to travel to the land of the worker par excellence, France. That's right, France. If there's one country famous for its strikes, its protests, and its strong unions, it has to be France. But how many workers are actually members of trade unions today? Well, we'll take a look at that here. If you'll notice, the unions peaked in the late 1970s. From then on, they've been in continual decline. Now, only 8% of the French working population is unionized. And France is just one example. I could have shown you a very similar graph if we were talking about Spain, the UK, or almost any other European country. The only exception I have is Belgium, which maintains union membership of 50%. Why? Well, that's a topic for another video. And I know what some people will say. Really? The working class has disappeared? But that's not possible. There are still a lot of groups living in marginal situations. There are the rich, and then there are the poor. And yes, you are right, but those poor people are no longer workers. I'll give you an example. Spain. If you're watching this video from Spain, you already know that the Spanish economy is going from bad to worse. All the data shows that there is more and more inequality between the rich and the poor. But the poor are not the workers, they're the unemployed. Roughly 40% of young Spaniards are unemployed. As you can imagine, if a politician approaches a young unemployed person to talk about labour rights, the young person would say, oh that would be great if I had a job. But wait a minute, because we are not done. This trend started in the early 2000s. That was the moment when the working class started to disappear in Europe. But the year when the real collapse of socialism began was 2000. 2008. Exactly. That was the year of the financial crisis. And many of you at this point will be thinking, how is that possible? The financial crisis was the collapse of the free market, the proof that neoliberalism has failed, the decline of capitalism, wasn't it? Well, from the electoral standpoint, the opposite phenomenon occurred. Let me give you an example. Greece. 
The Greece Social Democratic Party, the so-called PASOK, was one of the two major parties in that country. To give you an idea, in 2009, they had 43.9% of the votes. Six years later, in 2015, PASOK was left with only 46 8% of the electorate. That's right, they didn't even make it to 5%. Today, in 2021, the numbers are still very similar. PASOK has gone from being a governing party to being a pensioners club with a lot of time on his hands. So, what can the socialist do to regain the confidence of voters? What can a European do when he runs out of ideas? Where can he find inspiration? Well, pay attention. Copying the Americans. I know. Looking to the United States to copy ideas doesn't seem like the most anti-capitalist solution in the world. But let's be honest, the United States has the most professionalized politics in the world. Campaign consultants in the United States use polls, market research, and databases to run campaigns. That explains why the left wing in this country was the first to realize that the working class has changed. To give you an idea, in 1980, 20% of jobs in the US were in industry. In 2016, that figure was only 8%. In 1979, unions in the United States had 20 million members. In 2013, even with a much larger population, there were only 14 million members. But wait a minute, because that's not all. Some might think that the working class is more likely to vote for left-wing parties, right? That's the basis of this whole video. However, for decades, opinion polls have been saying just the opposite. If we understand the working class as people in blue collar jobs, we soon learn that being blue collar is a predictor of voting Republican. No, really. Of course, we're not saying that all blue collar workers vote Republican, but what we can say is that the Republican party is the preferred choice in this group. In other words, dividing society by classes is no longer a good strategy for getting votes, at least not if you're a left-wing politician. However, there is another way of dividing society that can work. Do you know who does vote mostly for left-wing parties? Racial minorities. Both Hispanic and African Americans are much more likely to vote Democrat. And that is how the so-called identity politics was born. And that is also how a new ideology emerged. An ideology that is neither communism, nor socialism, nor the third way. We are talking about postmodernism. The postmodern left no longer focuses on material equality, but on identity-oriented politics. I don't think I need to explain it any further. Just listen to the speech of any left-wing politician in your country, and you'll probably figure out what we're talking about. The problem is, what happens when you try to import these policies into Europe? Well, the main problem is, how many people of African origin are there in Europe? Are there really that many appraised racial minorities? Can we really say that Europe is the same as the United States? Well, we're going to take a look at that right now. The end of socialism? All socialist parties are engaged in open war at the moment, a battle between the classical socialists, the third way, and the postmodernists. In the UK, they try to go back to their origins. That explained the rise of Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn was a return to the essence of socialism. So how did he do in the elections, you may ask? Well, you can judge for yourselves. General election 2019. Worst night for Labour since 1935. BBC 13, December 2019. We are seeing something very similar in Spain. In Spain, the Socialist Party currently governs jointly with Podemos, which is an extreme left-wing party. For years, Spain was the exception to the rule. It seemed the last bastion of socialism in Europe. However, the polls are starting to look worse and worse for the Spanish government. And you only need to look at the map to understand that what we're saying is very real. And you may be wondering where all the votes are going that used to go to the socialist parties. Part of this answer can be found in, yes, another map. If you notice, there are not only red and blue countries. We also have dark blue countries and orange countries. The dark blue ones are the countries with nationalist right-wing governments. The orange ones are the liberal centre. These two ideological currents are becoming more and more significant. In some countries, like France, we could say that they are the new bipartisanship. We are no longer talking about socialists versus conservatives, but nationalists versus liberals. Other countries, such as Germany, are seeing the rise of other groups such as environmentalists. So now the question is over to you. Are we really facing the end of socialism? Will we see other ideological currents replace it? Or will we see a fourth way that brings socialist parties back to a new golden era? You can leave your answer in the comments below. As always, don't forget that here on Visual Politic, we release new videos every week. So subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell down there so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like this video, like it and I'll see you next time.